okay, they say, look, you don't want two states. Let's see if we can enter entertain the idea of one state equal rights. Jews, Muslims, and Christians can live as equals. Oh, once you say this, it's like, like throwing a nuclear bomb in Israel. Because they want to say a Jewish democratic state. How can you have a Jewish democratic state when today I, Saab Erika, the Christian, Muslim, Palestinian, from my hometown, Jericho, on the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, I am 50.9% of the population. Friedman and Netanyahu are 49.1% of the population. How can you just think of people who are trying to impose a 21st century apartheid, segregation, and subjugation of Palestinians? All right, let me, yet, can, I just, can I just ask you from the Israeli side? Because it, it, the Oslo Peace Accords allowed you uh, to arm, to patrol your own areas. Yes. And then suddenly, look, I was there between Israeli soldiers and Ramallah when it started falling apart. I, I was literally crawling on my hands and knees and on my chest when Palestinians opened fire after Israelis had opened fire. And, you know, I don't know who fired the first shot that day. But yeah. it, it rapidly unraveled to the point that, you know, fast forward in the, in the months and years, Israelis say the left wing Israelis who really believed in a peace process and, and don't want to be in the West Bank and don't want Gaza. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, you can never arm these people because what all we got were bullets and bus bombs in mm -hmm. Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. And that left wing really has largely evaporated, has it not? The peace movement inside Israel has, has evaporated, feeling greatly disenchanted with the idea that they would ever live side by side with a Palestinian state, especially an armed one. And that's what you get, Netanyahu, in 1993, when we signed the Oslo Accord. He stood up uh, behind, a, in front of a picture of Rabin, the prime minister at that time, put a kofiya in his head, and he said, if it's the last thing I'll do, I will bury this shameful agreement. Netanyahu is not a two-stater. So everything he did in his life was to destroy the two-state solution. He's, he's a man, i know him for 33 years. And when you, if I want to sum him up for you, I will tell you two things. One, he believes that there was no past before him and there will be no future without him. It's the ME syndrome, ME. That's what counts in his life. Secondly, ideologically, he believes that Israel is much more powerful and prosperous in conflict, not in peace. And, 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 and when you have an American president who's his main ally, who also has a doctrine, President Trump, that nations either born to be strong or to find strong nations to protect them at the right price. You know, the jungle has a law, chaos has order. But if you combine Netanyahu's doctrine with Trump's doctrine, what do you get? What do you get? Do you, you, get do you think, and I remember those days because it's important what you say, because there were posters all over Jerusalem with Yitzhak Rabin in Kef like the Arafat Kafia. And they were saying he was a, you know, I think in Hebrew, they said it was Dean Rodef. And that was what, why, that's largely what led to his assassination and the turning back of the peace process, even though Netanyahu said he would never turn the clock back on the peace process, there was no way of doing it. But in fact, he, he managed to turn the peace process back on its heels. Do you believe that there was another leader? If Rabin had lived, do you think that Oslo would have been implemented and we would be at a much different place than we are today? If Rabin had lived, we would have peace by now. We'd have two-state solution. If Ormort wasn't taken to jail and accused of these accusations, we would have had a, a, a peace. And every time an Israeli leader moves towards the real, reality of two states, some way, somehow, they make him disappear. So very quickly, if you could just answer kind of yes and no, so we can just run through the list. Um, access to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the Palestinian capital in this deal? No. A right of return or some compensation for, for refugees? No. A continuous piece of land, a homeland for Palestinians that go back to probably the 67 borders, including Gaza, with some kind of connection to Gaza? No. So what's in it for you? Surrender. And uh, Surrender. they call it... Yes, they call it peace based on the truth. And actually, he wants to destroy people like me and like Abu Mazen and like 
that Palestinian peace camp who want to live and let live, who have recognized the state of Israel, try to live in peace and security on 78% of historic British mandated Palestine and accepted to have a state on 22% of the land, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. He, he can't stand us. <laughs> they can't stand us. Because what do they say about us? We are people who want to achieve peace through negotiations, nonviolence, uh, through the help of the international community. We want democracy, human rights, women's rights, the rule of law. So he really wants to execute all of us. He wants to execute the idea that peace is possible between Palestinians and Israelis. And when someone like uh, the, the, the ambassador, uh, Friedman, who says, it's not us who recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, it's God. So <laughs> Judaism, Judaism was never a threat to us as Palestinians. It's never a threat, it will never be a threat. Judaism is one of God's great religions. So in the 20, 21st century, when a group of people come to you and tell you that this is a religious conflict, <laughs> what do you think they're doing? Don't you think that in my side, I have some people who refuse to shake my hand because I recognize Israel? Because they want to negotiate with Israel. And they insist in turning it into a religious conflict. This is not a religious conflict. Religion is, is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are for peace, saving lives. You know, our conflict is territorial, differences, uh, na narratives, national, and can be solved through negotiations. But this group of people, I mean, Israel, since 2017, they don't have national negotiators anymore. You know, in the past, I used to call my colleagues, who my counterparts. But they say you don't anybody. negotiate. They blame the Palestinians for not wanting to negotiate, for not accepting many deals that you were put have before them. Thing. You know, <laughs> that's, that's that broken record they use. But ask, ask in Israel, tell them who is your chief negotiator? Who is the Israeli chief negotiator? Who's Saab Arikat's counterpart since 2017? They have none. They have none. Their chief negotiator is Friedman and Kushner. And I, in each meeting I had with Kushner, I urged him to, that he sit me up with the Israelis because I have no problem with the U.S. My problem is with the Israelis. I need to negotiate with the Israelis. And he refused. And then he just copied and pasted the most extremist positions of the settlers councils and introduced it in the so-called plan of peace and prosperity. This, is, this, is the mo this, this group of people this so-called American peace team has put Palestinians and Israelis at least 50 to 60 years back. Last question, it's always a tinderbox. Won't this cause another intifada or an uprising or more violence? I mean, it's not gonna bring peace, is it? It's not gonna, it's not gonna bring peace. It's, it's, it's gonna bring more suffering for Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, they know, you know, Palestinians will not accept to be subjugated, to live as slaves. Uh, look, I was 12 years old. I, I was born in this house in Jericho. I was 12 years old when the occupation came to my hometown, Jericho. I'm 65 with eight grandchildren now. Let's say they annexed the Jordan Valley, as they say, 94%, and I'll be in, in clear. What will change? Will I change my name? Will my grandchildren change their names? What will they do if they don't have hope in their minds, if they don't have the possibility of living in dignity and peace and freedom. All what I'm doing now is trying to keep the hope alive in the minds of Palestinians. All I'm telling Palestinians, don't despair. You're not alone. We can do it. But all what Kushner and Netanyahu and Trump are doing are telling Palestinians every day, no, don't listen to him. You will never be free. You will never have a state. You will never be independent. You will never live in dignity. We will, you will have to live as a subject to the Israelis, an apartheid system. Yes, you, we're different. That's what they're telling them. Mm -hmm. And do you think Palestinians will stand on lines to accept that? They will defend themselves. They will defend themselves. Do you we will hope for a change? Them. Do you hope for just a change of, of administration in the White House later this year? Would that, would that at least get peace talks going? Well, I hear, I saw a letter yesterday, actually, of 189 congressmen and women that said no to annexation and no to the Trump plan. I saw 32 senators doing this. This is, I really appreciate this very much. I saw 222 Israeli generals, ex-generals, writing against annexation and, and against this and showing the dangers of this. I, I, I saw 192 nations worldwide standing shoulder to shoulder with me to say no to annexation, yes to negotiations, yes to this two-state solution. That gives me hope. But the time should come 
that these nations should tell Israel, should tell Netanyahu, if you move with the annexation, there'll be consequences. And, and that, 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 that what, what will stop him. But if he continues with the impunity, that he can do anything and get away with it, all right? He is not going to make peace. He's going to destroy any attempt to make peace with anyone. You know, annexation will mean the end of any possibility of a negotiated agreement between Palestinians and Israelis. Annexation would pose the, the best threat on Jordan's national security and internal security. The same thing to Egypt, same thing to the Arab world. Annexation would mean strengthening all elements in the Arab Muslim world who are extremists, who also want the conflict to be a religious one. That's a very dangerous game to play. You know, you cannot kill ideas with bullets. You cannot prevent ideas to travel with or without visas. If you want to defeat extremism in this region, and we should defeat extremism in this region, we should, we should defeat ISIS in this region, we should defeat all those who try to use God for their uh, political purposes and so on. And this can be done through two things. One is peace between Palestinians and Israelis. And my, my opinion, it's live and let live. It's a state of Palestine with East Jerusalem, its capital, to live side by side in peace and security with the state of Israel on the 67 borders. And secondly, democracy in the Arab world. And anyone who says Arabs are not ready for democracy is a racist. Cyberica, thank you so much. Thank you, sir.